Hi, my name is Michael Dingus, and I'm uh, very happy to be here. I'm just part of uh, Pivot Projects Jamboree and uh, Art Gallery. Uh, let's get started. A little bit of background. I was a commercial illustrator for 20 years, and then in uh, 2003 through 2005, I attended the uh, University of Chicago and got my MFA deg uh, degree. Now, at that time, um, there was a lot going on in America. Uh, outsourcing was uh, really taking effect, especially here in the Midwest. I live in the Chicago area. And you could see factories closing and manufacturing shipping overseas, but also cheap goods coming in from uh, overseas. Now, things have always been cheap overseas, but it's been hard to, to get them here. Um, so the development of the container ship was a really seminal event um, that really was a game changer. Uh, if you go into the history of the uh, container ship, uh, really goes back to the Vietnam War was what really started to accelerate it. Um, that's a whole different history, uh, but it's kind of fascinating how that happened and the, the uh, end results of that. Um, so this is what really kicked off that consumerist uh, bubble that we are now uh, reaping the uh, rewards, benefits, and externalities of. Uh, so, in f while I had that going on, uh, I was thinking about some of the early antecedents to worldwide global trade, and it made me think of Scrimshaw. Now, uh, Scrimshaw was the work done by early uh, sailors on the teeth and bones of whales. And uh, this is a typical example of Scrimshaw. Here, the teeth are decorated with scenes of ships, uh, some sentimental imagery, uh, some patriotic imagery. Uh, some other examples show scenes of whaling, which can be pretty grisly and violent. Um, and uh, I found it interesting that they would make work on the very uh, objects that could maim or kill them. And also, whaling is an early example of um, a globalized industrial process that almost decimated the very source of its sustenance. And uh, so I think it's important to think about that as we uh, work through uh, climate change. Another influence for me is trench art. This is a World War I soldier's uh, practice of uh, manipulating uh, artillery shells left over from battle. Now here's no man's land. Uh, this used to be a forest, but because of the war, this is what it turned into. So this is kind of a, a model for what can happen during climate change, but this happens to be war. and. Um, I think I've made a definition of uh, no man's land as the highly coveted, monitored, and disputed territory between opposing sides of a conflict, which no one side can either occupy or hold. And I think that's important, and that'll come up a little bit later. Here's an example of trench art. And what, what I find really fascinating about this stuff is this was also made in kind of the downtime between battles or while soldiers were recuperating in the hospital. So what's kind of interesting is there were, you know, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these artillery shells left over after the round was fired. And uh, here's one example that was worked by somebody who obviously had some skills. And what's kind of fascinating to me is this is a form of healing and um, mediating on the experience, but it's also a vase that holds uh, cut flowers. So it's something that holds something that's dead and alive. And that's kind of what the cut flowers are. But it also has organic imagery, but it's on a machined object. But it's also easy to forget that this is the result of uh, what a round fired from this could do to an environment and to human beings at the same time. So it's a fascinating uh, whole different thing for me to look into. Another uh, influence on me was uh, what are called early American schoolgirl samplers. And uh, here's a classic example. Now, um, because it has uh, stitch type faces on it, different styles, uh, some organic imagery on the border there. Um, and uh, they, I love the little poems that are often included in these. These are uh, models for virtue that were, that were uh, inculcated on the younger generation. So this is an 11 year old girl who stitched this in 1817. And that little poem says, rapid our days and months run on, soon, soon the night of death will come. That's pretty heavy for an 11 year old to kind of uh, contemplate while she's using craft to, to work herself through that. Uh, but I think it's uh, still true today. So I happen to have in my studio at the time in grad school, some uh, PVC elbows, and they kind of reminded me of whale's teeth and the way that they curve and they can kind of sit on the surface. Um, these are horrible, I uh, freely admit it. And the only reason I include them 
is because they were the first tries and it really kind of kicked off everything else. This was done with a stylus by hand and it's very hard to control. I later uh, uh, started using an electric engraver, a hand engraver, and that was much easier for, as far as rendering goes. Um, it always distresses me when I see plastic five gallon buckets on the side of the road or in dumpsters. Um, it's just, I know that's gonna end up in landfill and I see it all the time and it's distressing. Uh, this version here, I made a drum out of it because uh, in, in Chicago and around the world, you've seen people playing uh, drums on these kind of things and playing for change. Um, so this one again is around the time of the Iraq war. Now this piece is called Capital Bucket. And after I finished the first one, I thought, well, what if I put more handles on it and it could look like the US Capitol building. Now at the time, this was in response to uh, the run up to the Iraq war and uh, uh, the kind of disinformation and super patriotic imagery that was out at the time, um, boostering the effort toward war. Uh, but on the back is a quote from Hermann Goering that is uh, uh, pertinent to even as far, uh, recently as the Trump administration and especially after the January 6th in Capitol insurrection here in the United States. It's a warning. I keep thinking this, there's no reason to show this bucket anymore, but it keeps happening. Um, when I was in grad school, I had never used a computer before. And uh, so I acquired a, my first computer, which was a Mac iBook G4, and um, I learned to type and uh, had some, learned to email, had some rudimentary skills developing. And I thought, oh, it would be great if I could do Scrimshaw on a, uh, on a laptop computer. Um, but then I thought, oh, it's even better because I was worried about destroying the computer that if I could acquire some dead laptops, that would be even better. So here's the first one I did. And you can kind of see some of the uh, influences here uh, with the alphabet and the fingers, uh, that's uh, reminiscent of the samplers. Um, there's also this obvious uh, reference to Scrimshaw here on the white surface of a Mac computer. And also the uh, trench art in, in the fact that this is a spent object. It's dead, it's no longer uh, uh, useful as, a, as what it was intended for. And what's further interesting to me is the Mac, Apple Mac logo which was originally inspired by Newton's apple. But here I see it as Eve's apple, a symbol of temptation. Now, when you look at a plain or any Mac uh, Apple products, they're beautifully designed and they seem to have kind of a benign sleek uh, exterior. And uh, they are anything but benign. These are game changers and they've had a profound influence all over the world. And I think it's important to call that out and uh, to reference it. Uh, here's one called Dan of Minor, and it's just about the danger of what things might pop up in your digital legacy. Uh, this one's kind of called Mine All Mine, and this uh, squirrel is gathering all these different files or, or nuts, kind of storing them, but uh, does not look happy and is um, actually full of anxiety like all squirrels are. This one is called Homing Pigeons. Homing Pigeons, and if you look closely, you'll see that they are banded. And um, one says Facebook, one says YouTube, and one says MySpace. And there's another one up there that's yet to be identified because the race goes on. Um, uh, here's a close up of some of them so you can see some of the technique. Uh, this is in response to the uh, in, uh, housing crisis in 2008, the uh, economic crisis. Uh, this container ship is running ground because the lighthouse is, uh, is dark and there's just all kinds of stuff going on there. Uh, this one is about our relationships with uh, people on the internet and how they can go south on you, but yet we're all bound together. Um, this one is interesting to me because I think our internet experiences are, um, while flattering because you have access to anything, it's kind of an incomplete uh, association and relationship because it's, it's uh, not really fulfilling and it doesn't really resonate or satiate our appetites. So I would say that it's an ambiguous uh, distraction and that, it's, that can be manipulative and uh, coercive. So this is kind of a warning about that situation. Uh, this is one that's based on what's called the Marine Rifle Creed. It's really strange, I encourage you to look it up. It's, uh, but I, I substituted the word this for the word rifle and uh, then it makes a little bit more sense in my context. Um, I was, thought I was kind of done with these computers, but then I uh, started thinking about the pattern recognition that's useful in coding, obviously, and AI. 
And of course, there's uh, people who can read code and write code, but nobody can do it at the speed that uh, uh, computers can do. So I was thinking about that in different ways to express that through more complex pattern making uh, in my engravings. Um, this one is called Grace is Mastering a Flow of Time. And um, this was a um, quote from philosopher Henry Bergson. And um, these computers take about three to four weeks to engrave. So I get to kind of think about the uh, computer and the computer experience, internet experience, working on the outside of the computer instead of on the very inside. Because not only am I not very skilled at it, but it's important to step back from these things and, and look at them from the outside. This is one of my favorite ones. This is called Algorithms Are the Utensils We Use to Devour Each Other. And um, I think if we reflect on that, that there is potential for great abuse uh, with AI if we're not careful, if we don't think holistically about what the potentials are. They could be great things, but they also could be horrible things. Um, now, this is a response to um, the possibility of having our digital exhaust um, collected by Silicon Valley, but not sharing in the resources that are um, the cash that's um, developed out of that collection. If we're all, if data is the new oil and we are all derricks pumping out uh, digital in, uh, information, then I believe we should share in those royalties. And this piece is called Micro Labor Deserves a Micro Wage. Now, in this particular one, I think I went overboard. Now, this uh, says no man's land repeated over and over again, right side up and upside down. And again, I think the, that definition, like the World War I, uh, no man's land, is a good definition of cyberspace. And that is the highly coveted, monitored, and disputed terrain between opposing sides of conflict, which no one side can either occupy or hold. This is one of my latest ones. This is, again, a collection of five uh, G4 computers. And they're just kind of connected together again. Now each one you can't doesn't make any sense. It's just a letter or two, but all connected together. It says sucker bait, and I think that that is a pretty good comment on what's going on these days. Whether you follow QAnon or some other kind of uh, conspiracy theory, or whether you just get stuck on Amazon for hour upon hour. Um, I like finding things in the alley and transforming them. This is uh, called Captain's Chair. This is a plastic chair that I found in the alley outside my house. And I decided to engrave it and uh, just have all kinds of things about physics and patriotism and, uh, and the dangers and all of those things, which way they could go. Now, this piece is called Work Table. This was a, a community project with the John Michael Kohler Arts Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Now, and I put we uh, set this up with uh, printing out what I call time cards, and you can see those on the right and all over. We got over 400 responses from people that put their names, their occupations, their work experience, and any um, advice they had for future generations. And I took those names and occupations and I engraved them on this work table. Um, now this image on the top is the, uh, um, a reference to the National Recovery Act, the uh, 1930s Roosevelt uh, administration. It's an eagle with a, uh, a gear and lightning bolts kind of showing the industrial and the, in, and the uh, intellectual innovation that's possible. Now here this eagle is either dropped in or is about to pick them up, but it shows the, all the experience of the local community and what they could possibly bring to the uh, recovery. Now this is a specific reference to that. This is called the National Recovery Act, and it's about 11 feet wide or so. Now this comes from a house that was bank foreclosed and sat empty for two years before it was purchased. Now if you look at the dormer above the front door there, this is the very vinyl siding that I harvested and uh, turned into this piece here. So uh, it's kind of a memorial to the loss that this family experienced uh, during the financial crisis and housing bubble. And uh, going forward, it's, uh, it's a warning as well. Now this was part of the Kohler Arts exhibit, um, and this is called Container Ships. This is 12 factory style push brooms all connected together, but I trimmed down the uh, bristles of the push brooms so that they looked like container ships floating across the horizon. And I cut down the uh, handles so that it echoed the uh, curvature of the earth. This piece is 24 feet long. Now this piece is, uh, comes from a quote from 
uh, Stephen Moore, who's an economist, a pretty conservative uh, economist, market-based uh, economist, who related a story about Milton Friedman. And um, I'll read it to you because I, I think it's interesting. It says, at one of our dinners, Milton recalled traveling to an Asian country in the 1960s and visiting a work site where a new canal was being built. He was shocked to see that instead of modern tractors and earth movers, the workers had shovels. He asked why there were so few machines. The government bureaucrat explained, you don't understand, this is a jobs program, to which Milton replied, oh, I thought you were trying to build a canal. If it's jobs you want, then you should give these workers spoons, not shovels. Now that's kind of an economics joke, and, um, but I don't find it very funny. I think it's a kind of a cruel joke. And uh, so the name of this piece is, at the end of the day, a shovel is a spoon. Because if you don't give people a chance to work, a chance to uh, feed their families and sustain themselves, then bringing a canal in uh, is not really uh, going to help those at the very, very bottom, maybe eventually, but it's not gonna uh, uh, be an equal transition. Now this is a piece called uh, Lifeboat, The Wreck of the Invisible Hand. Now this piece is suspended so that when you are looking at it, you, your eye level is about midway up the boat so that you feel like you're in the water and you don't really have access to get into it. So on one side, side it says, send help, and there's all kinds of uh, sailor type poems uh, in there with uh, octopus arms coming up with like CO2 and long chain polymers. And on the other side, there's uh, more of the same with some of that same kind of uh, sampler, sailor poetry. Uh, in the letter D there in the middle, for, for instance, uh, it says, spheres of special influence lead to widespread turbulence, while concentration on GDP leads to increased entropy. And on the left in the O, it says, every institution tends to perish because of an excess of its own basic principle. And I think you could say that about a lot of institutions, whether it's capitalism or um, Boy Scouts. Here's just a, a close up. Uh, I was thinking of bond salesmen because of the uh, housing crisis here. Um, beware the school of pilot fishes, for in the playground in the rye, there is sure to be a, a shark nearby. Here's the end, back end. Um, this, these two phrases, optimism is cowardice, and it's too late for pessimism, is a pretty brutal assessment of the current situation. But it's that kind of attitude that brought me to pivot projects in that I think it's imperative that we take action now and turn this around. And I don't want to be this period seen as the time we wish we had back. So um, I'm encouraged to be in part of pivot projects for that very reason that the gathering together and pulling everybody together is uh, what is possible to make the change that needs to happen. Uh, here's the front, go forth and send no more. So thanks for listening and I look forward to any questions that you might have.